Hi everyone, this is Erica Mello and welcome to episode number 36 of Tough to Treat. This one is on shoulder pain. And if you're listening to the episode immediately when it gets released, I want to wish you all a very happy holiday and a wonderful, wonderful new year. Susan and I have really appreciated your support over the year for our podcast and we're looking at doing new things next year and taking it to a whole new level. So look out for some uh, great stuff coming from us in 2019. So this episode is on a patient of mine who has persistent shoulder pain. And the crux of the podcast is a focus on motor control. Shoulder pain is very common. Is it articular? Is it a soft tissue problem? Is it a motor control problem? Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's all about motor control in your nervous system. But when is motor control the primary driver? The first thing you focus on. So join us as Susan and I clinically reason through this really interesting patient. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, everybody. This is Erica Mello and Susan Clinton, and we are the hosts of Tough to Treat. How are you, Susan? I'm well, Erica. How are you today? I am good, thank you. And we are looking at two weeks, almost until the holidays now, and uh, New Year's, and God, about three. God, I can't believe 2018 is over with. Can you? It's crazy. It has been <laughs> a, it's been a wild ride this year, for sure. Yeah. Oh, my God. I look back on the years, and I'm like, wow. It just, time goes by so quickly. It really does. Anyway, we all, we hope that you've enjoyed our podcast and it's been, gosh, this is episode 30 something, five or six, and we do it every other week. So it's been out about a year now. So um, if anybody has any suggestions for content or another way to present the material, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we love talking about patients, but sometimes we like to mix it up. So feel free to email either one of us um, or contact us on social media about maybe mixing the podcast up and maybe interviewing. If any of you have a question on a patient, we could you know, pick your name out of a hat and, and perhaps just interview you for the podcast and give you feedback on your patient. That would be amazing and a great change to um, to our format. So if anybody has a tough to treat client and they want some advice, you know, contact us and we'll uh, get you on the, on the podcast. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. It sounds right. great. Okay. Perfect. So let's dive in. Okay. Um, my patient, and I apologize for the audience. I'm just coming off a cold, so I may sound a bit hoarse and, and, uh, and such. So I do apologize ahead of time. Uh, Okay, this is a patient of mine who I've seen on multiple occasions for many different issues. Uh, he had originally come to see me for some, uh, some hip pain and some foot pain and knee pain about, I'm just looking at his chart, last year, June of 2017. He was doing well. He returned to see me over the summer for some issues with his back. And he was fine, good to go, came and went. Uh, and now he came back at the beginning of September, and I've only seen him a few times. He's very, he's a, he works uh, in the, the, the wine business, and so he travels a lot, you know, to different countries, and he is extremely busy, so I, I, we try to fit each other in before and after his trip. So his main issue is a left shoulder pain. He's had it for years. He mentioned it to me when I treated him for his knee and his foot, and he mentioned it to me when I was treating his back wasn't a big deal. It was just like, oh, when I get done with the back, let's look at the shoulder. So it wasn't really, you know, affecting his life in any way. So just some history. The guy is a cyclist. Um, he does uh, do a lot of these long trips uh, overseas on bike. He, he's in, since I'm in New York City, he did, goes around Central Park all the time. It's a road bike and he's pretty re religious with that. He, he does it at least four times a week. And so he, had, he saw a orthopedic, uh, I think a physiatrist here last year, who diagnosed him with tendonitis, quote unquote. Um, initially, his symptoms, he thinks they came on when he was trying to uh, prep for a climb um, to the Matterhorn. And, and he did, a, it was a level five climb. So it was just a lot of gripping and, you know, not rock climbing, but it was just a lot of climbing and hiking and just a combination of both using his arms. He did a lot of push-ups. 
at the time as well. This was in December of 2017. He also, he actually got a cortisone shot, which gave him four months of relief. And uh, he reported that after four months, the symptoms did return, but the intensity was not as bad. He is right-hand dominant, so he's not a lefty. His symptoms are on his left. He tends to use his laptop quite a bit where he is turned to the right a lot, okay, for some reason. Mm-hmm. This is sort of his office setup. And on the bike, uh, in chatting with him, his, when, so he's leaning forward, his left hand is behind the right. So he's almost in this left rotation when he's on the bike. Okay. So, you know, for people like that, I always say, okay, well, what, how's your position on the bike? How's your position at the office? What are you doing that could be feeding into the problem? Mm -hmm. So since he does bike quite a bit, he said, oh, but now that you think of it, my left hand is behind. So the reason I brought this patient up is at the beginning, after the first visit, he was, um, he felt significantly better. And I'll tell you what I found and what I did. But then a few weeks later, he came back and it was sort of going downhill again. And I want to get your feedback on, uh, because sometimes we have patients, we've seen them for different issues. And, you know, we don't get complacent, but we may overlook things or, you know, I'm always leery when someone gets better immediately. I know it sounds crazy, but... I've not, and the minute they come back, like I felt great after one visit, they're good. They inevitably, something else is going on. And that's my experience. I don't know about you, but that's my experience. So, interesting. um, yeah. Okay. So I just did a stay. I had just come, did I, when did I see him? No, it was before I went on the Sarman course. So I basically just took a look at him in standing, just, you know, I do a general listening. Uh, it took me to, to uh, you know, the, his scapula on his left side, his rhomboids, his upper traps. They were all just sort of jacked up, a lot of muscle tone. Clavicle was elevated. This is just I was, what I was seeing in standing. His scapula was, you know, abducted. It was depressed. The left humeral head was anterior. So he was in this sort of shoulder girdle torsion to the right, elevated clavicles, everything elevated. Nothing crazy, but it was just what I noticed. Uh, I also noticed that his upper rib cage, his third, fourth, and fifth ribs were more prominent on his left, okay, which means he was probably in this left translation, right rotation. Nothing crazy with the neck, a few just sort of twists and turns. Nothing, you know, to be really honest, that I wouldn't have expected given what I saw in the shoulder. And that's that's what I looked at. So his main issue was lifting his arm into abduction. I'm just, so when you're doing ab, not internal rotation, but almost like abduction and internal, neutral to internal rotation. I'm just showing you here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, so he could, she flexes, he could flex his shoulder. He could abduct his shoulder. He could put his hand behind his back, all singular motions he was fine with so when you combined it with an abduction neutral internal external rotation and then if you and taking the arm back like you're rowing that's when it got him that was the only thing that bothered him so for example reaching back you know not so much to put his hand in his pocket because he could do that but when he went up into abduction like if he was in a car and he had to reach back to to, to put the seat belt on that got him uh, you know, maybe hailing a cab in New York a little bit with that abduction that Mm -hmm. got him. Other than that, he was actually pretty good. He could sleep on that side. No major problems. His recreational history was, but was basically on the bike outside. So when he, I had him do that. And the minute he did that, his scapula elevated everything that I saw in standing got worse. So the rhomboids turned on the upper traps turned on the scapula elevated you know, every but the, the the position of his shoulder girdle was unchanged. The position of his upper ribs were unchanged. So it was this, basically this was while, when, while while he was on the bike. No, while he was elevating his arm well, into was, ab, okay. abduction, okay. internal rotation, or neutral. Did and, he have pain with yes cycling? No. Okay, so no problems in cycling. So weight no bearing is okay. Yes. Okay. All right. No problems in cycling. It was really open chain, uh, but not like just not just raising your arm like you're in class. It was really that combination. And then when he added a little bit of um, you know scapular retraction to it, he got. I'm thinking maybe pinching biceps tendon, but I didn't want to like think 
too specifically on this. So because the first thing that I saw was the scapula and it was just, it, you know, yes, your scapula is supposed to elevate a little bit when you raise your arm, but his was like going from the get go. And it was already in a, in, in, I believe not the best position for his, what he needed to do. Some people have that position in their shoulder blades and their cloud and they're fine and that's fine. But he, when he, when he lifted his arm, it got worse. So what I did was I just unload, I just basically put my hand under his axilla and I unloaded the shoulder. I just gave him some, I'm doing it here. I just gave him some, just some support. That's all I did. And I said, just do the same thing over again. And he was like, Oh, that's much easier. So I'm thinking, okay, what did I just do? Yes. I unloaded the scapula. I unloaded some of the nerves in the neck. I'm going to stop here and get your thoughts because sometimes with me, I, when I, I do that correction, when I unload the scapula, I'm unloading many other things, not just the scapula, but he was, it was much better after that. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I'm sitting here thinking, you know, the whole time I'm thinking hmm, what's going on in the cervical spine, but actually when you just mentioned that I'm, I'm starting to think maybe it's not the C-spine, there might be some tension up in there into the cervical plexus, but I think this is much more of a brachial plexus issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if you're, if you're putting the tennis ball and actually giving a little space, um, perhaps what you're doing is, is alleviating maybe some compression onto the uh, brachial plexus yep. underneath there. Uh, mm -hmm. So it felt good. It felt yep. good to kind of get that, the, the ball or, you know, whatever underneath there and, you know, in, in kind of a, a roundabout way, I guess that people like to use the word release. I'm not a big person about that word, but, mm -hmm. you know, kind of just changing the input into the subscapularis, you know, but it sounds to me like a little bit brachial plexus, although he's not having like the tingling down the arm no. and, and the other stuff, but that doesn't mean that you still can't have, you know, localized, you know, kind of joint symptoms and the other thing that made me think about brachial plexus was the it's concomitant motion that gets him it's yeah. not a singular plane motion no you know so it's when so something's happening with the humeral head mm -hmm. as he goes into abduction and then winds up it's either not rotating or not depressed or maybe depressing too much i don't know you you had your hands on him but yeah you know and i'm just wondering if with those motions he's getting into because Maybe there's something going on and he's not gliding in the humor in the uh, glenoid like he should. Yeah. yeah. But maybe he's getting dropped into a little bit of humoral head depression. Yeah. Which yep. is actually just giving him a pain response rather than, you know, the tingling down the arm kind of thing. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that could account for why everything's tightening up and pulling because, you know, yeah. the, your brain's not going to want your humoral head sitting on the brachial plexus, I can imagine. So that's very right. interesting. Right. Also interesting that, you know, but it kind of, makes me think that also because when he gets into weight bearing onto his arm with cycling it doesn't bother him so no. that the weight bearing must glide his humeral head back up ah that's you know true. and so as he goes into abduction it's getting it's gliding down yes um you know and, and again neutral abduction isn't a problem but no he adds rotation to it yep you know that's when you're probably get you know so that that's my first thought but anyway mm -hmm. go ahead this is yeah. fascinating yeah yeah no for sure and it's interesting because when i when he got on the bike his left arm was back but that's a movement pattern he's adopted for years and for whatever reason that works mm -hmm. for him so yep. and it's interesting when he when he was preparing for the matterhorn he did a lot of push-ups okay fine that was just a piece of information he's not one to be in the weight room he's just a cyclist and he doesn't not a big you know weight lifter so so what i ended up doing um because of time on that first visit i i wanted just to see what i would what would happen if i just got my hands in there on the mm -hmm. scapula and just did some distraction mm -hmm. just just to see if the rhomboid tone would would decrease i did a little bit of soft tissue in there uh uh, just I was just mo up upper rotation distraction. I mean, just trying to get the blood flow and to free up if there was anything that was limiting the mobility, to see if it was uh, a mobility issue versus a uh, a timing issue of of the cuff or something. And so I ended up doing uh, just putting a piece of tape to unload the scapula and unload the. Well, now that we're talking, unload the whole brachial plexus, and he felt significantly better. 
So I talked to him about changing his uh, office ergonomics as well to get the computer and the laptop more, um, you know, in front of him. So he came back the next visit, which was probably the following week. I'm just looking at my notes here. Yes, he felt he felt significantly better. Okay, and he said the tape was really helpful, et cetera, et cetera, and. I repeated similar. I repeated a few of this, uh, this, this similar interventions to what I did the prior session, and I also did. I, I for some reason my gut was telling me to go up into that upper rib cage a bit because I had him repeat the task, the abduction and and internal rotation, and he was still elevating, but it was much better. But he also exhibited this sort of compression in the front of his chest where he was almost like the pec minor was getting was turning on and it was almost like bringing the, the the shoulder into more of like this this twist to the right does that make sense mm -hmm. so I, I did a little bit of just some manual therapy and through there i had him lie on his side and had him just do some elevation and we added some movement patterns on the side into in and out of rotation i did do some i'm a big believer in just some rhythmic st stabilization work for the shoulder just to, to start firing up some of the appropriate muscle groups. And I did a little bit of that and I ended up having him go on his tummy and I had him do like that figure four position that, you know, right. Almost like a pivot prone. And he had a hard time getting into that position on his left side. And so I just had him drop his elbows a bit and he was, it was almost like he was impinging up in, and that was a combined, that's a combined motion. So I got him out of that position because I felt that was a, uh, I, I was winding him up, up a bit too much. Mm -hmm. So I pretty much did the same thing. I taped him. We did some motor control and side lying with rhythmic stabilization. I just did have some soft tissue work as I did prior. He was fine. He was going mountain biking that weekend. Okay. Up in Vermont. And he came back uh, the week later and he had lost some of that carryover that he had from mm -hmm. the previous visits. That was, this would be his third visit. And this was actually after I had come back from the Shirley Sarman course. So I was just like her advanced upper quadrant. So I was all into the scapula with her stuff, but I had him just do a basic single arm raise, basic shoulder flexion. And I saw something there that I hadn't seen in the beginning. I saw, it wasn't painful, but I, I saw him elevate the shoulder, which he didn't do initially with that movement pattern. He did it more with the combined pattern. It, it was all much better, but he had lost something. So was it with mountain bike and getting on the bike? Maybe, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to fast forward ahead. So he, tra he went traveling for a couple of weeks. I think he was in Europe. He came back still, no change. So he had made great progress the first visit. He lost a bit from the third visit and then he went traveling for three weeks and he came back and he pretty much was not changed. He, he kept saying the best was the first visit. The best was the first visit. So I'm going to stop and get your thoughts. Yeah. First of all, when he travels, does he carry a bag or does he backpack it? I think both. Okay. I that that starts to make a little bit of sense to me. You said in the very beginning that he was an extensive traveler. Yes, um, he travels a lot. Yeah. So I'm wondering how he's carrying his bag um, or if he's doing a backpack. He, when he comes to see me, I believe he has, he has an app. He has a backpack and he's always carrying it over his left shoulder. Ironically, yeah. now that I'm thinking, I'm visualizing him coming into my yeah. office. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I'm wondering if that may be one of the drivers of his dominant pos um, patterning. Yep. Here going on because that would certainly, um, you know, just pull in the whole raise up the shoulder thing. And also if he's got some increased pec minor tone, mm -hmm. that would be a piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of what I'm thinking is when you saw that whole shoulder girdle raising up with flexion, you know, later that you didn't see before is, I'm, you know, you did a lot of work on the scapula. And I'm wondering if you actually kind of got the scapula moving, whereas before it wasn't. 
Mm -hmm. So it wasn't lifting up as much and now it is because yeah. it's moving better. So Correct. you may be kind of going, you know, kind of like peeling the onion. You may be actually by cleaning some stuff up, you know, in the movement pattern. Now the, the, the thing is starting to reveal itself. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, people like this who kind of like put up with it for a while, when you bring it to their attention, then all of a sudden, you know, their pain experience changes because now they're kind of internally micromanaging all of their movement patterns kind of without that you know it's like when you get something stuck in your teeth mm -hmm. you can't leave it alone mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering if you know a little bit of that is going on too like he's now he's kind of thinking oh well what if what if this is this position what if it's that position and maybe doing a lot of motion testing and you know different things to kind of you know try to pinpoint what's what's actually happening whereas before he just kind of did these mass movements and didn't worry about it unless he you know reached back and did some of those things so that could be a kind of a piece of that too you know i'm still the, the all of this is still kind of hit, uh, hitting me about uh you know something that for whatever reason and especially since he couldn't get prone with his arm you know mm -hmm. put his forehead yep. on his on the back of his hand for everybody yep. who's trying to picture the prone position so it's abduction external rotation and you drop your forehead onto your hands you mm -hmm. know in the prone position he couldn't get his arm in there well of course that's the concomitant wind up mm -hmm. that he couldn't do but yep. You know, there's, there's, for whatever reason, his humeral head does not like to glide superior, it sounds no. like to me. It's no. really not doing that. No. And um, so and I'm not so sure about brachial plexus stuff anymore as much as I'm kind of thinking, gosh, this for, you know, this really sounds like a, you know, like a real joint glide problem to me more than, you know, than anything else. Yeah. And it's you've gotten the scapula gliding better, but the joint itself you know, and he may have been using some of those scapular patterns to help him actually, you know, move his shoulder joint as much as he possibly could. And now that that's been, you know, changed a bit. And so now you're, what you're really looking at is what's what's happening in the internal, you know, mechanics of the shoulder joint itself. Yep. The other thing is, too, and I like what you talked about with the pec minor and kind of looking at that. And that led me into is he carrying a backpack and what's he doing? Um one of the things that might be really helpful for you is get in and take a look at and his rib movement with breathing and and see if mm -hmm. you can i'm wondering with his uh he went mountain biking and then he went traveling um if there's some when he hyper respire you know respirates you know when he's getting going i'm wondering if he's able to access good pump handle motion mm. you know uh in his upper ribs you know, he's probably getting good basilar motion. Maybe he's getting a lot of scaling stuff, but I'm wondering if he's lacking the pump handle yep. kind of motion. That'd be something really good to check out. And you can just have him just put his arms on a, on a chair, you know, on the chair arms and just hold on and mm -hmm. have him take some deep breaths and see if, you know, you can get that pump handle to start going. That might be a kind of a reverse way to um glide mm -hmm. the humeral head upward you know because you're mm -hmm. kind of working you know what i'm saying you're working the ribs and the other stuff uh, you know it's yeah, like yeah, you're yeah. holding one end and moving the other you know so you're yes. moving that end and you know the shoulders being held so things are moving around to it instead mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. was kind of what you were doing with the ball underneath too is the shoulder was kind of being you know, uh, held and everything else, you know, all the soft tissue underneath was being mobilized, mm -hmm. which is yeah. you know, thinking maybe with the ribs too would be a good way to do it. But that would be something he could take into and use with, cause he, you're probably not going to, he's probably not going to stop carrying a backpack, but if you no. can give him some better things to do while he's carrying the backpack and see if that begins to, you know, change his patterning around, you know, his backpack carry or, you know, bike, mm -hmm stuff because even though he doesn't hurt when he's doing those things they may be feeding into a posture that prevents him from doing some of the other motions but it really is starting to sound like a true glide problem to me right right yeah i agree and you know i the rib movement is great because with breathing because his upper rib cage I, I i guarantee you he probably doesn't have great 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 movement mm -hmm. there because of the, the the amount of cycling that he does and he's just right so grip you gripping and you know i initially thought that you know why is his scapula elevating why is his humor his humor head is anterior obviously just because of the movement patterns that he does um not unusual and, and very common so i i would agree i think the humor i do think it's a joint problem so you know when you elevate your arm and you combine it with a, a di different motions your humeral head has to has to do something it has to move you know mm -hmm. and and spin roll and glide the appropriate way and i you know people the cortisone shot gave him relief but if he he 
it's four months and he, you know, he just resorts to the same movement problem over and over again. And that's what I was trying to explain to him. So the next visit, I said, let's just be a little creative here. So I had him do his movement again. Ab you know, I'm just doing here abduction, sort of neutral rotation. I said, just push into, I put one finger on top of his left wrist. I said, just push into my hand. Like you're just like, you're just like, I, almost like I was muscle testing him. But I said, I'm just going to give you a little bit of resistance just to fire up the cuff just a little and do your movement. Just, just lift your arm up, just push into my hand, my finger a little bit. And he was able to do that. And he had zero pain and it looked significantly better. So I had him down. I got him on his side again and had him do, it was just easier to do it that way. So, you know, just basically having him just push into, um, in, into external rotation isometrically, Yeah. you know, yeah. and just, and just move and just move. And I got him up. I think I maybe did 15 reps of that, got him back up and sitting, had him repeat his, his movement and he was fine. Okay. So then I said, okay, well then, you know, we're, we don't want to go down the rabbit hole of let's just give him a band and do external rotation because that's, you know, that can be helpful. But for him, I think it was more of a timing issue in terms mm -hmm. of, yes, he wasn't, his humeral head was not functioning appropriately. And yes, I was able to fire the cuff up and get him moving, but he's got, he's not going to learn how to do that immediately. And he'll go out and put his backpack on and then he'll just come back the next time and he'll be the same. So I gave him a couple things to do at various, like uh, isometrics at zero, 45, and 90 degrees of abduction, you know, just literally having him do some external rotation mm -hmm. with that. And he came back the following, he, he traveled again for a couple of weeks. This is, he, he travels in between the visits. And he said that it was working on doing those isometrics was extremely helpful. So I'm going to stop there and you let Yeah, me. I love it. I love it. That's great. Um, th thank you for, for taking him down that path because it could, we could have gone two ways. Number one, we could restore glide. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still think, and even if that's the choice that you want to make out there, that's fine with me. I, that probably would have been my first thing. Would I, I probably would have gotten him into sideline and some internal rotation um, as much as he could get into with his arm behind his back. And I really would have worked the, the, the superior glide from that direction and position. Um, and, but the thing that I would have done after that would, would have taken him into the timed, uh, it's, it's part of rhythmic stabilization, the timing, mm -hmm. you know, the timed uh, isometrics, you know, positional isometrics, sorry, not timed uh, isometrics, but that's, that's, a, that's a basic part of rhythmic stabilization, which, you mm -hmm. know, could be called a thousand things, just movement mm -hmm. of the shoulder. But um, I like it because when you get into that, again, it's that which part is moving. So you keep the hand from moving, the shoulder joint has to move. The humeral head is going to have to do the motion because the hand can't. You know what I'm saying? So we've got that reverse kind of close chain thing going on. You're just, and with the arm, it's really, I think, much more productive to get it into a bunch of different positions because the arm is different from the leg. The arm is all about, you know, moving in all planes around the body, whereas the leg, you know, the body's moving all over the legs, you know, more. So it's, you know, kind of a little bit different, but when you keep the, the hand from moving or the arm from moving, something's got to move somewhere. Yeah. And so that's kind of a way to kind of actually get those, you know, that, you know, whatever you want to believe about internal biomechanics, it doesn't really matter to me. We just want that humeral head to move. Yes. And we want it to move pain free. Yep. And <laughs> this was a way to get him to do something to counteract the dominant posturing that he was in. Like you said, he was just going to go back, but you know, he would never, if we had just given him bands to do, you know, mm -hmm. he, we're, all we're doing is kind of strengthening a, a pattern that isn't really appropriate for him mm -hmm. because it's a pattern that takes him into pain. Mm -hmm. So I like the way that you pulled him back from that some, but gave him something really good and simple to do that seemed to alleviate his symptoms. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, so I guess, you know, the, the question is why? I don't know why it worked, yeah. but <laughs> I don't know it worked, you know. And so that the next step then is, what did you do? Because I would have taken him into some timed motion between those. Well, so that's, 
as right. we move forward. Well, that's when I took that was my last visit, which is before Thanksgiving. Okay. So that's where we are now. So wh where should I go for now? So yeah, yeah. Right. So I think, you know, you could, you could go uh, closed and open chain, I think. You know, yeah. you could, you know, he's been doing some isometric stuff, which is so cool with the rotator cuff and loading in those different positions. Mm -hmm. but whatever, re I've done this a lot with um, uh, people that uh, weight lift, you yeah. know, and overhead, you know, lifting that end up with, you know, some of that pain in their shoulder. It's, you know, I you just get them loading in some different positions below to really kind of beef up the 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 work of the deeper muscles a little bit mm -hmm. so you could take him into you know just see what kinds of ranges he has now yeah and i would take him to closer to some of those end ranges and start loading yeah you know because you had him loading in pretty good mid ranges and that seemed to yep. have helped yep. um you know provided that he's still feeling good when he comes in or, or, or is still the trajectory is going you know back in the yep. direction you want it yeah i would start loading him you know kind of on those outer edges of yep. his motion, outer edges yep. of internal, outer, outer edges of external, external with abduction, various things. And yep. he can also kind of put his hand on the wall, you know, and move his body around too. So you mm -hmm. can, you know, kind of go at it from a couple of different ways. But definitely, I, you know, I think that uh, you're, you're onto something there that would be the direction that I would have gone for sure. Yeah. And I would just increase the range of motion of his loading. The other thing is, is that if you haven't done the, you know, looking at the upper ribs and the movement of the upper ribs, yeah, no, I'd add that. that in just because yeah. it's just going to be, you know, he's a biker and he's a hiker, mm -hmm. you know, if we can get all of those ribs, you know, moving great, that's just best, better for much more efficient respiration for him. And yeah. if there is a bit of some neural tension in there, then that could help mm -hmm. begin to kind of move that out in a, you know, pretty natural way. Yeah. Um, yep. But that could give him some other things that he could actually do when he's, you know, when you're walking, I want you, you know, if he's got the backpack on, I want you to think about making sure the air is getting into this upper part of your chest, not mm -hmm. here in your neck, but in the upper part of your chest. Yeah. You know, as you're kind of moving or as you're biking, is there any way that he could come up and uh, release the grip just to kind of straighten up and access yep. the pump handle breathing a little bit before he yep. goes back down into the crouch to hold on? Yeah. You know, um, if he's on a flat stretch while mountain biking, I mean, that's hard to do when you're on a hill, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, it, it's, I know it's great stuff. I think for him, because it didn't really limit his function, yeah. like the back or like the knee did, yeah. he didn't really, he didn't care. It was mm -hmm. one specific movement pattern. And, you know, w literally the ironic thing is, and, you know, after treating him for his back, I literally, one visit, the back was good to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was more probably of an acute issue. So he he's expecting, oh, I'll be good with the shoulder for one visit. I'm like, not so much because you've mm -hmm. had this for over a year. The back was like, you know, two weeks. Okay. Yeah. So And probably it, likely has had some shoulder posture patterning for longer than a year, you know. Yeah, so it's, it's sure. you know, deaf. And it's not his dominant side either. No. No. You know, so it's kind of like, oh, dad gummit, every time I reach back like that, it hurts. And then they go on and do something else and forget about yeah. it, you know. <laughs> yeah, and the more I'm, I'm sitting here, the more I think that that backpack while traveling, because it really depresses the whole mm -hmm. that left part of his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's definitely a contributing factor. Uh, in terms of the loading, I like the isometrics. Um, I'm wondering, because he's so okay with closed chain, I'm wondering if I get him on all fours. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what I was kind of there. You know, with yeah. the arm on the wall is, the, is yeah. kind of a variation of getting yeah. on all fours. Weight bearing doesn't bother him. No. Mm -mm. So it would be good to explore some of those motions. Yep. You know, yep. and see where you can take, you know, where's the edge? As mm -hmm. Corey Blinkenstaff used, likes to say, mm -hmm. you know, find yeah. the edge of the movement pattern. Yep. And where can he get in there and actually explore what yep. feels good and what's kind of like, ah, eh, it's a little dicey right there. Maybe I just need to kind of skirt around that and just keep moving until he can kind of smooth that edge out a little bit because then he can use his whole trunk. Plus that the scapular, you know, helps kind of mm -hmm. just get the scapula and trunk moving, moving. together quite a yep. bit as well. And you've already worked on that some, so it would feed into pulling those patterns together just a little bit. But yeah. you know, weight bearing is going to glide his uh, humerus up too. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting after the first visit, now that I'm thinking, it's always helpful to talk these things through because you realize <laughs> after looking at your chart. So the first visit, maybe first two visits, I mobilized the scapula, taped him, got things moving, and then he was good. But then this little humeral head started things sort of popping up literally, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and that sometimes 
that may have waylaid me a little bit at the beginning because I didn't see that at the beginning with the mm-hmm. scaffold. It was so obvious. But but the reports of, oh, you know, that was the best. Now I'm, you know, now I'm about the same. So if you're continuing to do the same thing that you've done, like for the first two sessions and the person got really much better and now they're not, you got to go down. That's the lesson learned here. You got to yeah. go down a different path. Yep. And you got to change directions. Change directions. And that's what I did. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so he's still, I'm still, actually, I'm going to have to contact him. He's probably traveling. But the thing is, he traveled a lot. And, and I think he just resorted to his old strategy in between. Of course. Sessions. Yeah. And, you know, traveling is stressful. And you're going to get back into your old patterns and do what you can to be as efficient as possible. He's traveling yeah. internationally as well. I, I think the other take home message here is scale, scale, scale. You know, yeah. you didn't, your instinct said, do not put him in regular old band exercises. Mm-hmm. Once you found out that, okay, if we could get him sidelined and he could do a few of these isometrics. And that tends to change things how can I get him to do this at home? You mm-hmm. know, what, what can we do and how is he going to do it? And, and, you know, when you got his buy-in on it because it, it made a difference for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, you know, but not go straight into, okay, well, let's just work external rotation. It's like, well, no, maybe not, mm-hmm. you know, maybe again, you know, where kind of where on the scale were you? you, you know, when you're doing just isometrics at different parts of the range, that's on the lower end of the scale mm-hmm. and that's okay. Um, to stay there for a little bit and let that get better and Mm -hmm. then come back rather than trying to go to the top end of the scale for the home exercise program, Mm -hmm. which would have been bands, right? Because that not only do you have to pull against the resistance, but you have to pull in reverse motion. Correct. And he may not have been quite ready for that. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's that. I mean, that's where I'm at. So I will, you know, I will report back and let, let everybody know how he's doing. And um, that's great. Thank you for the input. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> yeah, Very absolutely. Cool. All right. We've had a couple of interesting shoulder patients over the last few podcasts. We'll have hey. to pull them together for everybody in maybe a series. Yes. So if you go to our website, one of the things that we're going to be doing in 2019 is um, actually kind of pulling some of our podcasts that have similar themes together so you don't have to go hunt and peck looking through them to find Mm -hmm. oh i want to hear what they were talking about with the shoulder well we'll have them kind of all grouped together like a shoulder series so you can listen oh okay so that here's all the stuff on the shoulder here's all the stuff on the foot or here's all the stuff on pelvic floor and incontinence or you know some of the other things we've talked about so Mm -hmm. um to try to make it a little bit easier for people to um access uh, a particular topic if they're just wanting to review something or listen to something or hear what we have to say about foot pain when it doesn't really come from the foot. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay. so that's, that's going to be one of our things. So, so awesome. We will, we will see you all again. Uh, well, actually, I don't think we will before the end of the year, right? Uh, let's see. This is pro- maybe, maybe not. Yeah, by the time this podcast is aired, we're going to be at the end of December. December. And so I'll just take this moment now to wish you, Erica, a very happy and prosperous new year. And all of our readers out there and listeners out there, the very, very same to you. And Um, thanks for checking in and and playing along with us all this time. Yeah, Yeah, it's been fabulous. Happy holidays, everybody. Yes. Bye. Bye.